Tonight we're going to do a, um, a workshop on script coverage. So I'm going to work, this is one of the most important things that you could possibly learn as a producer, as a director, and as a writer. And even some crafts below the line, cinematography and production design and editing, if you have any aspirations of finding a project to turn into a movie, you would also want to know about this. So let's go and start this process right now. Um, script coverage is basically, think of this scenario, everybody. You have very busy lives. Um, when you start to move on in your profession, you have lots of scripts that you're going to be given, and people want to work with you as a director and a producer, for example. So what's going to happen is you're going to get this big pile of scripts, and you're going to have no time to read them. And so what happens is there's a system that got developed. It happened from, from the 1940s on, where basically people are hired as script readers to they get paid money. It's one of the best entry-level jobs in the studio system in Hollywood or New York. Um, script readers. And what they do is they take this pile of scripts and they're assigned to a script and they're assigned to um, present a log line, which is a one sentence summary of the script, a synopsis of the script, which is a summary of, this, of, the, of the script, and in, written out as, as the plot's unfolding, and we'll go into that in a little, great detail in a little bit, and also comments. What do you think about the script? And the reason that you do this is there are various reasons. Big, bu busy producers, busy directors, um, even writers who want to know what's going on in, in the world, they, or they want their script covered to see what somebody else, a professional, thinks of their script. What's going to happen is they um, want to get a sense, is this something that I should take off my pile and actually read myself? Okay, That's a really important thing. So you have a lot of studio executives. When I was a studio executive, every Friday I took a bag full of scripts to read as a producer because I just to thumb through it but I also have them covered to see what is the script about, is this a script worthy of my attention to read in a lot of detail. And so the, so the reason that we do this from a producing point of view or a directing point of view is you're looking to make movies and you have scripts. One of the best ways to make a movie is to have, find a script, yeah, it needs a little bit of work, but let's, I, can, I, can, I can fix this, I can sell this to the studio or get some independent financing, so that's the reason why you want it. Another reason why you want it is to attract talent. So let's say I have a script that I really like and I want it covered so that when the agent can show their star, their George Clooney or their Catherine Zeta-Jones or their Jennifer Lawrence, we can have a piece of, they can be reading a thin synopsis, comments about this character, and that's why we would want to do that, because that's, they often want to see that as well. So um, pretty much it's the standard way of doing it. Some people don't like it, because especially writers, they don't like, they, they want their script read by the studio executive or by the director. They don't want somebody being paid as a script reader. But from my own personal experience, I can tell you it was very invaluable. And that wasn't the only way I approached the script. I would often read, read it myself as well, or some parts of it. OK, so let's break this down. So we're going to get into just what I said in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, uh, so why it's done, it's an efficient way of getting through piles of material and in a way that can make sense so people aren't waiting weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks to find out whether you're interested in developing the script, you know, optioning the script, and working on the script, okay? So what are its components? Here are its components. There are three, well, actually, let me do this. There are three essential parts of a script. Actually, we'll go back to this. The, there are four, actually. There's this content information over here, see this, there, which basically states the name of the script, the title, the format, what is it? Is it a screenplay? Is it a book? Is it an outline? But generally it's going to be a screenplay or a book. 
Uh, what is the budget? You don't really need to worry about them. That's nothing that you'd. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, a book is like uh, a novel? Yeah. It's, right. It's so, to... Right. So exactly. So um, there are lots of ways of. Think about some movies that have come out recently. Some are based on books. Some are based on games like Lego, right? Some are based on you know original their original source material. You have a true story about your life. You pitch it to me, a producer. We get a writer. We make the movie. So there's a variety of ways, but most often when you're doing script coverage, it's going to be a big book. I mean, sorry, doesn't matter. A book, a short story, something that's written, or a script. Okay, we're going to focus now on this class on a script. Okay, so. Um, it's going to, you have this header information right over here, which is basically telling the person who hired you as a script reader to, um, uh, who submitted it, and what's it about. So it's, who's it written by, what the genre is, what kind of material is, is it, which we'll get into in a second, and where does it take place, and when does it take place. Okay, so it may be present day New York City, okay, or it may be, 2,200, um, the planet Mars. Whatever it is, that helps, again, that helps us, you, the, 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 the producer, the studio executive, the director, we get a sense of what this is essentially, um, where it's taking place. The next part of a script, uh, the, the script coverage, um, which this is kind of, consider this as a template, is the log line. It's a one-sentence description of the story. And the reason it's so important is it, it far transcends just doing script coverage. When you folks make your student film and you submit it to film festivals, people are going to want to know what the log line is. Okay? It's part of your package. When you're pitching something to, uh, you don't have a script, but you have a great idea. The first thing you're going to start to talk about is what's the overall story about? That's what a log line is. Okay, so it's, it's not just about script coverage. Pretty much anywhere you meet somebody at a party, you meet somebody at a, you know, at a cafe and they say, what are you working on? So no, I have a great project and you could just pitch the log line. If you make that log line really great, people are going to be really interested in your project. Okay, and they may even you know, say, let's, let's make a deal on it. The next part of a script, um, coverage, this is, what a, this is a script template, is the synopsis. The synopsis is a, is a summary of the story, and we're going to get into that in a second, about how to do this. But the important thing is, again, somebody hasn't read the script, so you're walking them through this script. You're not, if there's a chase scene that is involved with 10 pages of it, you're not going to have 10 pages description of this. You're going to just pick the key items that help a reader understand what the plot of the story is. And then the last part of this is you're going to be asked your comments on the script. And there's a variety of things you're going to talk about. And those things are on this grid. Okay, you're going to talk about the characters. You're going to talk about the dialogue, the structure, the story as a whole. Does this, does this seem like an interesting commercial story? The pacing. Does it move along? Does it get stuck? Um, and then you're going to be asked to, rec do you recommend this or do you not? So we're going to go into an example of this a little bit later. So um, let's dive in now to um, a great, um, I suggest if anybody's interested in learning more about this, I'm going to kind of float through this a bit, um, somewhat you know, in the space of two hours. Um, you can Google. ICM script coverage, and you will get this pulled up. ICM is a very famous, it's one of the big major literary and talent agencies. You just Google that, you'll see it right away. One of the first things, and there you are. Okay. So let's, let's, do, let's just walk through this. How do we do script coverage? Tell me, can you see this in the back? Do you need me to, you need to increase the size? OK. All right. Log line. Again, one sentence description. What's the general premise of the story? 
Um, it must include a variety of things, not just what's listed here, in my opinion, but we'll give examples in a second. Um, the protagonist and major story elements. Conflict. What are the stakes? What are the goals of the protagonist? Who is the antagonist? Again, for those of you who don't know, protagonist is the central character in the story. You consider them often the hero or the anti-hero. And the antagonist is the person or thing opposing it. So in the movie Alien, for example, the protagonist was who? The first, does anybody remember? Sigourney Weaver. She, so there was an alien on board a ship. She was the commander of the ship. She was the protagonist. The antagonist, the thing that was creating all the problems on that ship, was a thing, an alien, right? It was a creature. It wasn't a person, so it doesn't have to be a person. You want to make it very concise, which means very short, and you want to make it zing. You want people to get very excited about it. So let's look at some of these examples that ICM gives to their readers as like an advice on how to write a, script, a, a log line. First one, an attractive young nun and an ex-leprechaun venture into a bizarre Irish fantasy world to return a stolen magical ring. Okay, so what do we have here? We have a protagonist, two actually. Um, they enter a bizarre Irish fantasy world. So we have the setting, some that's something that's not there, to return a stolen magical ring. Okay, so their goal is to get this, and we can assume that in order to get this, they're going to have a lot of conflict. There's a bizarre world, and there are people and maybe things that are going to stop them from getting that to happen. Okay, that's their journey. Okay, second one, a private detective gets in over his head when a simple missing persons case turns into a deadly chase for a priceless diamond. This to me is a better log line than this. In this we have to guess what is, what's stopping these protagonists from getting what they want, okay? In this one, we have our protagonist, private detective, um, getting in over his head is a good description. It means this person is probably not equipped to be doing the job that he has to do. Um, a simple missing persons case, he has to find, um, he, he thinks he's only looking for a person, but it turns out he's looking for a priceless diamond, so he has, there's this conflict, there's this deadly chase, okay? So we have this, again, the sense that this is a big event that he has to figure out how to overcome. And then the last one here that they give is an amnesiac, amnesiac plane crash survivor discovers that he is a government assassin, or is he? Protagonist? Um, do we have an antagonist in here? Again, is there, who's, who's opposing this protagonist? Well, it's the accident. Uh, and the people that tell him who he is. Perhaps the people who tell him who he is, or also, um, if he is, the people who are out to get him, okay, because they needed to stop him from being an assassin. So th those are examples. I think in each of them, we could make them better. Um, I, we'll, we'll circle around to this at the end to see, if, to see how to do this. But for me, it feel the, the important things that I always feel should be in a, in a uh, log line are the protagonist, the goal of the protagonist, what they're after, the obstacle, the person or thing, that's fighting them from getting that to happen, making their life miserable. And if, if important, the setting or the time frame. So for example, if you wanted it, it wouldn't make sense if the, the ones that I read to you, um, if it happened in the future and you didn't indicate that, that could be a problem. Here would be an example of one. You, as a setting, you might start out a, a, a log line with this. In a world where babies are born from fat, out of ba big barrels, right? So right away we know this isn't our world. This is some other world that we're entering. And then you would tell what the story was. In the year 2050, when um, dogs walk on, 
back legs and speak to human beings. So we're just giving the setup of what this world is like. Okay? Without it, we wouldn't have a sense is that this is a story that we're interested in. Okay. So, rules of a log line. They're short. I would say to you, in only rare instances would you have a log line that was more than a sentence. And it's, um, you never use your character name, you never say John or Joe or whatever the name of the protagonist is, because it doesn't, it's wasted space. It doesn't mean anything. It only means something if you're telling a true story. So, uh, you know, you could have the story of, you know, um, uh, in, in uh, what was it? In the, Jerry, when was Henry VIII? 18th, 16th century, 15th? Okay, in the 16th century, Henry VIII plans on killing wife number six and complications ensue. Okay, so Henry VIII is worth mentioning because we're talking about a historical drama, right? So we want to know there's a real person, so you would obviously include him. Use vibrant adjectives that give depth to and specifics of the protagonist or an antagonist. Does anybody have an idea of what we mean by that? Let's go to our example up here. An attractive young nun and an ex-leprechaun venture into bizarre Irish fantasy world to return a magical ring. Let's get rid of the words attractive and young. A nun and a leprechaun walk into a world, different world, to return a stolen magical ring. Do you see that that's kind of bland and not very specific, right? It's just a nun. A nun could be 30. She could be 80. She could be, um, you know, uh, feeble. She could have be, her mind is half lost. We know nothing about her. In fact, what's important about this is she's an attractive young nun. I'm guessing the reason that I haven't read this particular script, I'm guessing that this is important because somehow her beauty and the fact that she's young is going to play into this story. It might even play into the fact that the ex lep the leprechaun isn't just a leprechaun, he's a former leprechaun. Okay, that's important. That's more detail for you. And see how easily it's written. Two extra words, you know, I guess this is a word or whatever. And right away, you're, not, you're no longer dealing in very general terms. We're very focused. We understand this. Okay? They venture into a um, bizarre, what does that mean? Weird. Weird, Weird. different, strange. At any moment, something, something crazy could happen that could upset them and create problems for them. An Irish f fantasy world, so this is taking place in Ireland, okay? That helps us. Um, to return not just a ring, it's a stolen magical ring. So again, every time, this is the really weird thing about, for me, about log lines. On the face of it, it's the most easy thing to do. I mean, what could be easier than just writing, reading a 120-page script and writing a one-sentence description of, the, of what this is about. To me, this seems kind of easy, and yet, it, to me, it's the hardest thing in the world. I do, I would probably start out with a young, I, I would start out with a nun and an ex-leprechaun, uh, you know, walk into a fantasy world and return a ring. And I realize, God, if I'm pitching this to somebody, why would they ever be interested in starring in it, directing? financing it, they wouldn't. So you have to keep on working it. How do I make this more attractive to somebody? Because the point of a log line is to get their interest. Whether it's uh, in a film festival, to get people into the theater to, to watch your movie, whether it's in, in, in most particular instances, um, to get you the director, you are the talent, or you the producer, or the production company to invest in my pitch or my, in my script. Okay, let's do another one. Amnesiac plane crash survivor discovers that he is a government assassin, or is he? What if we started out with this? How would you, how, what would be the difference for you? Uh, um, a plane crash survivor discovers that he is an assassin. Okay, that's it. So, really? I mean, that doesn't, it's not gonna, it's not gonna make me interested in getting this. 
adding the word amnesiac is really important here, right? It means that somebody doesn't know their bat, and that somebody who has amnesia means they've forgotten all their, their memory is lost. So that's obviously going to play into it. If it turns out that this person weighs 300 pounds and it's not important to the script, then you wouldn't put that. If it turns out that he's married, you wouldn't put that, or she's married, okay? Um, but, uh, and that's actually probably a we, oh, okay, that he's married. That's not important in this script. You pick out the adjectives that, that are indicating what your story is about. So here would be an example. Let me make, let me make up something. Um, a 400 pound person with heart trouble must run a mile to defuse a bomb before a building explodes, okay? It may be that this character is married. He loves pizza. Um, he um, drives a Ferrari that's specially built. People have to help him. And that may be not be important to the story. What matters is he is 400 pounds and has to run a mile to, it's like a ticking clock. So you pick the words that matter the most to you. Let's do this to the last one. Um, a private detective. Let's change this from a private detective um, uh, uh, working on a, simp uh, on a missing person's case um, searches for a priceless diamond. Okay? Again, that's a kind of a bland thing. Just imagine somebody pitching to you when you write your log lines for whatever you're doing in your life. Read it aloud. See if it seems like it's at all interesting. If it's not, then just forget it and try to I mean, not forget that one. Work on it. So what's important here is he's a, he gets in and over his head. What does that mean? What does that expression mean? It's kind of an in the, it's for you know it's a specifically English expression. Anybody know? Well, that he's not not so it's not just doing something he's not supposed to do that he's not capable of doing. Okay, it would be like a an amateur burglar. Um, uh, uh, wants to break into the Louvre Museum to steal the Mona Lisa, okay? So that's a person who's in and over, an amateur burglar in over his head to, to steal the Mona Lisa, which is one of the most guarded museums, paintings and museums in the world, um, and seeks the help of a five-time convicted burglar, um, something, something to that effect, okay? All right. Next thing, so ICM, for some reason, they, they want you to include in your um, story coverage character breakdowns, but I've never needed that, and so you don't do that. Um, there's no reason to do it. The only reason to do it actually is, let me correct myself, is if you're, if you're in a talent agency and you want to start to attract an actor, okay, so then you would give, um, uh, you, would, you would mention this. So, for example, they give this, they give this example here. So, um, Seven. So, the, did anybody see the movie Seven? That serial, uh, that, uh, that thriller with um, Brad, Pitt. Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman, all right? And Kevin Spacey. Um, the part of the serial killer who was ultimately played by Kevin Spacey. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, this important feature, Kevin. Uh, what they're saying here is you want to only include, like, the protagonist, the antagonist, and maybe a secondary character. But if you feel like there's somebody else, like Kevin Spacey is the one who's actually the, serial, the, the killer, um, he only has a cameo, meaning his voiceover, you want to include that person. But what I'm saying for you here, for the purposes of both this workshop and just in general in your lives, you're not going to have to do a character breakdown, except if you're trying to lure talent to your project. OK, so a synopsis. Tell a story. After reading the script, take a moment to decide what the story is essentially about. Your story should not try to reproduce every detail, just the facts which the reader of your coverage will need to know in order to understand what's going on. So again, let me tell you an example. Did anybody see the movie Bra uh, Braveheart with um, Mel Gibson, who also directed? OK, it's a, sprawl yeah, it's a sprawling saga of a, hist of a part of is it English history or Scottish history? Sorry, Scottish history. 
the Scotsman here is the one who is correcting me. Okay, so when the, one of the big um, battle sequences occurred, the writer simply wrote, unlike most writers, the battle begins. Why? He didn't feel like he's not the director. So many writers get into this trap and then write 10 pages or three pages of like this happens and then this happens and then this happens and then this happens, but they're not the director. That scene took, I think, three to four weeks to shoot. It was a big budget movie. They shot maybe the, so this one sentence had like three or four pages. I'm mean, sorry, three or four weeks, millions of dollars. But in this case, that person only did one sentence. Mostly what they do is they'll write three pages. This happens, this happens, this happens, this happens. And as a reader, you don't have to go into all that detail. It's not important. What matters is how you describe in a, in a um, fierce encounter between the Scots and I don't know who, the, who were the other English. Um, uh, the battle um, turns in, in different directions until finally the Scots prevail, OK? One sentence, there was a three or four or five page scene. A lot of action scenes, same thing. Lots of action written. You don't need to include all of that. Present tense, this is really important. The action should always be written in the present tense. In other words, we're imagining, we're, as I'm reading coverage, I'm imagining in my head what I would be seeing. If it's written in the past sense, he walked out of the room, that's not something that you can actually see. He walks out of the room is something that I'm watching a movie, I'm watching a character walk out of the room. If some of the story takes place in the past, like you're going back and forth in time, then introduce the action with a phrase like, flashback to 1965 and tell the 1965 action in the present tense. When that action is over, move ahead in time by using a phrase like, return to the present. The key thing here is simply this. Imagine that you, what, how you're going to write is you're going to help the person imagine that the movie's been made. And so we're watching it unfold. And you can only do that if you're writing in the present tense. Does everybody have, anybody have any questions so far? We're good to go? All right. Um, when a person or place appears in your synopsis for the first time, put his, her, its name in capital letters, OK, like this. Uh, let's say, um, we had that, um, let's say, the ex-leprechaun in that story is only known as an ex-leprechaun, okay? It would be ex-leprechaun. And then the next time you see that person, it might be the X leprechaun. I'm not sure I'm spelling this dot, dot, dot. The attractive young nun. Let's say her name is Mary. Okay? Mary, first time she appears. After that, it's Mary. Does anybody have any idea why we would have this kind of rule? What? A new character? Yeah, but what about, yeah, Huey? It's easy to see. We can just look at the, it doesn't get confusing. It, right away, we know, we, we introduce, when, the when they're coming into the story. Oh, exactly, all of that. It helps you, we'll see in a second when, we, when I'm going to show you a piece of coverage, how it can just appear and pop on the page. Okay? Um, extra details. High quality synopsis include key non-essential details whenever such details will give the reader of the coverage a sense of the script's tone or style. This is not always necessary, but in subtler material, such extras may be essential. essential. So in other words, um, if and th by no means would I ever expect this to be happening right away, but um, you, you, to give a sense, let's say, in a, in a character-driven um, piece, like, uh, was, oh, sorry, wrong people, Manchester by the Sea, a very subtle piece about a, 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 uh, an uncle who, um, when his brother dies, is, supposed to, is suddenly having to take care of his nephew, and he's ill-prepared for that because of some history in his past. So you might, sort of, you might sort of indicate, and he lives in a boating community, 
and you might, and you, he, he lives in a house that's been, he lives in basically a studio apartment, and it's disheveled, and it's like, you know, and maybe, maybe there's a, there's a photo on the, there's a photo on the dresser, but it's X'd out, or something like that. I'm not saying that happened there. Just a little bit of a flavor to give you a sense of what this guy, where he's li living. That's important. Why it's important is it turns out he's given up on life. So he doesn't give a crap about where he lives. He doesn't, it, it has no personality to it, you might say. Not a, not, a, not a picture, not a painting on the wall. Just that little detail helps give us a sense of who this person is, all right? Um, and remember, your script is your best friend to do coverage. So you can use, you can lift things from the script to give you um, a sense of you know, the place, the person. Maybe the character is described as an attractive young nun, Mary. So you can use that in your coverage. Uh, OK, so um, your comments should begin with a summary. OK, so now we're actually, now we're, now we're in a, so that's the synopsis. And we're going to give you an example in a second. Now we're dealing with the, remember, we have a comment section. So you, the reader, get to give your comments. You've read a dreadful script. You've read a great script. You've get a script with promise. You've gotten a script maybe where the writer is really good, but maybe this isn't the best script. Or the other way, great idea, not well written. Why is that important? Well, that tells me the producer, like, wow, I'm not really interested in this story, but it sounds like we have a really good writer. Maybe I can use that person on another project. I'm getting introduced to a new writer. Or um, a terribly executed story, but wow, what a great log line. I'm interested in that log line. I'm interested in that story. Sounds like I'm going to have to get another writer. Maybe I have to work with him or her one more time, and then I get rid of them, and I get to get the writer that I want to execute what seems to be a great story. I myself have done that, where I read, I, I've often read scripts where I thought, I want to make this movie. This is not the writer who can do that for me. So oftentimes what has to happen in that case is you must work with that writer. You must make a deal with them to do another pass of a script. And then after that, you're free to move on. So you kind of gulp. You kind of spend your studio, hopefully not your money. You spend your other people's money to pay them $10,000 to do a next pass of a script. And you know it's not going to turn out well. And in most instances, as you get more and more experience, even here at Academy of Art University, you might find a writer who you are working with, you're not really they really can't execute this. Maybe they're even a good writer, but they're writing the wrong genre. It's not really something they know how to do. Um, I've hired people like that. I've hired people where I'm kind of doing a favor. They know personal friends. They're really good writers. They're really good comedy writers. And suddenly I'm giving them, because they're desperate, a film noir to write. And guess what? They don't do a good job. So that doesn't really, that's a lesson learned. You don't get in that trap. Even at AAU, be careful about working. Be kind of, I would say, be very collaborative, but a little bit ruthless. What I mean by that is if you kind of your gut tells you that you have a project and an idea and, an, and a pitch, and now you're looking for a writer, and you have a choice of three writers, and one of whom is a good friend but doesn't feel like this is the right material, another is a person who's a really good writer, but doesn't, hasn't ever written seeming like your horror movie that you want. And then you have a horror writer who's actually a really good writer. Maybe that's the person you go to, OK? Um, so what are you going to conclude? Let's talk about the general structure. You're going to have a summary paragraph listing the strengths and the weaknesses that you're going to then go into detail. Um, so you're going to talk about these things. All of these things are going to be what you're going to then describe. Because why? They're what makes a script, really, what makes a script and a story. Who are the characters, the dialogue, the structure, the storyline, and the pacing? We'll get into, back into this in a second. Prioritize. So wait, so let's go here. Simply saying dialogue is good, the second act is weak, characterization is excellent, is not very helpful. Why is that? Because you, when you say dialogue is good to me, 
I have no idea what you mean. You do, but I don't have any idea, just like you don't have any idea when I say dialogue is good. You have to get more specific. Um, uh, if you like the script, then explain why. You can quote dialogue to make your point. This, like, um, uh, one of the projects um, that I found and supervised was a project, um, a script called Heathers that I found and then I kind of got it together and worked on that and the dialogue, every other word had me cracking up. It was the most original dialogue. So if I were to do coverage on that, I would be quoting these, you know, I'd say this dialogue is like you've never heard anything like before. <laughs> Example, and you list the dialogue, it's like, you know, we'll get it. Okay? Um, the relative importance of these things that I discuss, the characters, the dialogue, the structure, the pacing, the storyline, will vary from script to script. Therefore, you prioritize your comments beginning with the whatever element is most significant. So, for example, in a thriller where you're wanting a lot of twists and turns and surprises, your first, um, your, your, um, your first part of this discussion might focus on the storyline. Less about the dialogue, not or action adventure, maybe less about the dialogue, more about the action adventure, the story. So you just have to decide that, but you'll definitely include um, as many things as possible. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Uh, so on action, is this a log line slash one sentence summary of the character description? So um, when, <clears throat> when, so let's give the example of. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a client of ICM, and uh, my, uh, I'm, a, I'm a writing client, I'm a, I'm a screenwriter. So they'll take my script and they'll get it covered. And the agents who represent talent, the actors and actresses at ICM, will be looking at it and then they will pitch, the actors won't necessarily get it, but the agents will pitch the log line to the talent. And then if the town, so it's just the one-line description. An ex-leprechaun and a young priest, a young attractive nun rather, enter this bizarre fantasy world and to, um, to um, snag a magical stolen ring. An actor, an act, the actresses that somebody's representing, again, um, forgive me, Jennifer Lawrence is by CAA, but at the moment I'm not thinking of an ICM uh, client. Jennifer Lawrence gets this, oh wow, I love, I love Ireland, or I love the, I'd love to play a nun who's attractive and flirty and whatever. Is that what's going on in the script? Can we make that going on in the script? So they will get that um, from not necessarily, they won't necessarily get the script coverage, but sometimes they do ask for the script coverage, and that's why at all these talent agents, they make sure that if it's a client that they're working with, their, their grid here, which we're going to get to in a second, when you give your final comments about do you recommend, how do they write characters, how do they write dialogue, good, fair, excellent, or poor, they always stay at good or above. So it's kind of, it's a strategy, right? That's how you do that. Any other questions? Um, any other online questions? Did you have a question? I have a question on, on the comments. Okay. Any producer trust us enough to judge the scripts for him? Good question. The question is, if this is one of the first jobs that you can, an entry-level job that you can get in the industry, how does a producer or a production company executive or a, um, an, a, uh, an agent trust your opinion? Okay? So the answer is, for me, I was always a little bit skeptical, which is why I always wanted to read some of a script. But I would say you kind of grow into this. So it's really about your quality of writing, how well you write, how well you describe a, a story. So maybe I won't, I tended to focus on what is the synopsis and what is the log line. And I cared a little bit less about the comments this person until I got to know them better. And then I could trust them. Okay, so if you can, if you can write a great log line, even if, the, again, and you don't necessarily want to lie in a log line, you write, you write a crappy script and a bad story you're not going to be able to, you don't want to necessarily sell it as anything more than it is. But you can, st but you can still describe a character by a sordid detective, a sleazy prostitute, whatever it is that describes this person correctly, 
you can still do that. And so I get a picture of who, who it is. So my comments, the comments won't matter as much. OK. Um, so um, questions to elaborate when writing comments. So now you give, and first you did your one paragraph. Now we're going to get into the detail. The story. What is the script's intention? How well does it fulfill that intention? What works, what doesn't work, and why? How strong is the concept? And how well execute is the story? In other words, if you said the storyline is you know, off the charts incredible, um, I've never seen a story about an, uh, an ex-leprechaun and an attractive young nun getting together and going through this adventure, you know, you, you're going to give more specifics. Um, what worked in it? An unbelievable first act. I was gripped. And then it falls apart. The second act of, a, of the script, they, they're on this journey, and it takes forever to any, for anything to happen, for it, them to have to struggle and overcome these forces who want to kill them. It never happened. Or it suddenly... They find the ring, they do one quick little fight, and then the end of the story. That didn't work for me. So it, just imagine you heard that as a, you, you hired this reader to write this coverage and you read that. You get a good sense, right, of what's, what was the problem? What was the problem with it? And again, you might say, okay, okay, I can fix that. I can work with a writer and fix that. Um, think other questions to think about in terms of structure. Does the pacing build effectively? In other words, if you have an adventure story, is there, is there a slow rolling thing where everything is going against this person? At the end of the second act, all hope is lost. Does that all work? Do the subplots enhance the main story? Every, every film, even your shorts, generally have an A story, the main story, and a B story, something else that's going on. Okay, Watch any of your one-hour dramas that you love on Netflix or Television, same thing. It's never just one storyline. How are these handled? Do they take over? Do they suddenly, your, your main storyline is lost, okay? Um, are there scenes that should be eliminated? Is it go, this, you know, it just takes you away from the main story. Does it feel too long? For example, most scripts are between 100 and 100, comedies are generally 100 pages, some even 90. If your comedy is 150 pages that you just read, I think you would probably indicate this, this is a 150-page script, 40 pages too long, <laughs> OK? Um, does it feel short? Are there any scenes missing? Does the writer have a firm grasp on screenwriting? Again, questions that help us understand this script that you just covered. Characters. Think of movies that, what's a movie that somebody just saw where they liked the main character? Passengers, okay, can you, can you, without, don't worry, what's the one line summary of that story? The log line. Okay, passengers, log line. No, what, Jack, 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 just answer the question. Just say it one more time, because it's good. So it'd be two people uh, wake up 100 years earlier than they should on a spaceship that's headed to another planet. OK. Where they're like cryonized or anything, hibernated. OK. So let's just actually work with this log line a little bit. Two people. You two are two people. Jerry and me are two people. We're two older people. Is there anything else that could help us get a better sense of who these two main people are. What are some other, did anybody else see Passengers? OK, just let's think about what other, what other, what other descriptions could you give them that gets us a little more focused in on this? OK, so it's a, are they astronauts? OK, well, I didn't see them. What else? So they're just, they're just people apart. This was in, OK. Any other description that you could give? So now we know it's a man and a woman. Okay, a reporter. Okay, is the is the is it the the man or the woman who's the reporter? Okay, so he's the mechanic. So a female reporter and a male mechanic wake up a hundred years early or young. You can include that whatever 
qualities are important in that script is what you would want to do, okay? Another example would be, so for talent, let's say, somebody asked a question online about talent for that. Um, let's say we wanted um, Emma Stone, okay? So we would want to make sure that we may want to say a beautiful reporter, okay? Um, or a sassy or a vibrant or something that is a great quality or maybe the opposite, a, um, uh, um, a suicidal reporter. Again, to, oh, wow, that's, that's a role I would like to play, somebody who's constantly thinking at any moment they want to kill themselves. Academy Award winners for movies are often for women, people who play prostitutes. For guys, people who gain 400 pounds to do the, their movie, that's often like, oh, wow, look at, look at all they did for the, that's really great. So those are kind of, weirdly, that's the case. So, but a good, lo really good log line there. Okay, so now get into, yeah. Is it good to fix in like a, a long sentence, as long as it's just one? Yeah, but you don't want to have and, 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 but yes, oftentimes you have to kind of stretch it out. But, it, you know, here's the deal. Two sentences are better than one long sentence that just could really, is too difficult to kind of grasp. So what I would say to you, Jack, is that probably that really long sentence, if you walked away from it and came back like an hour later, you could probably cut it down. And it really depends on the type of script that you're dealing with and how many twists and turns are going on there. Okay, so tell me about, did you like the characters? Okay, what did you like about them? Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a conflict that just goes up and down all the time. Okay. They fall in love with each other, they argue with each other. Did they feel, uh, did they surprise you at all in, in who they were and how they acted? Yeah, yeah especially the, the male one. Okay, so, and were they three-dimensional or rather there? There were many parts to them. They weren't just like, you know, um, you know, uh, Beautiful. It was like, but beauty with other qualities to her. So, right. So, characters. Are the characters three-dimensional? Good thing. Are the characters complex? We don't always, we, we, we're unexpected by their behaviors and their actions. Are they compelling? Have we seen them before? Or are they completely new to us? Are they interesting? Are they sympathetic, motivated, believable? Do you believe that these people could actually be in this situation and, or do the things they do? Okay, uh, an example like, you know, this guy is the biggest coward on the world, in the world, and yet by page 15, he's going up to people who are black belts in karate and beating them up. That would be a ridiculous thing. You would make sure that you would indicate that. Um, do the characters change throughout the script? What do they go through? Do they overcome obstacles? If the answer to these are like either nothing or not interesting, you would want to indicate it because, again, the point of this is to help the person who assigned you to read this to give a good sense of the story. Um, do they develop relationships? Dialogue. Okay, again, the dialogue is great, not helpful to us. Is it humorous? Is it effective? Is it good? Does it match the characters in the story? This is often what I, when I used to, when I was a reader or when I look at the material myself, a story, a screenplay, are they speaking the way they should speak? Okay, um, I just gave an example to a, a, a graduate student here. She wants to describe one of her characters as a man of few words. So then I look at her, if I look at her script and I see that man talking in long sentences, okay, that doesn't make sense, okay? Um, is there too much dialogue? Is if you look in a page, when you scan every page, is it just dialogue or is there actions going on? Is there more telling than showing? What does that mean? Well, or, or are you explaining things rather than showing what happens, right? Are you actually showing us pounding on the table are you explaining in some way, like, uh, you know, or the, 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 um, the, the, the person um, pounds on the table and, well, it's not a good example, let's see. Um, 
uh, in a in dialogue. He says, "Oh yeah, he 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 got really mad and he left the room." Versus maybe showing us what that looked like. That would be an example of that. Okay, action, visuals, commercial potential. Again, in answer to your question, Jack, would I think that you would have enough knowledge as an early, as a beginning person to give me a sense of what the commercial potential is? No, that's my job. It's my job as a producer, a production executive, or a director um, to say, wow, I haven't seen this movie in a while. There used to be a point, Jerry and I would know from years ago, where horror movies, they only occurred once a year, basically, at Halloween. <laughs> Okay, that was it. And then somebody, I forget which project, it broke the mold. It went at a completely different time. It was the number one, you know, box office hit for weeks at a time. So suddenly, but let's imagine, um, again, a time when there was only buddy-buddy comedies were only men. And then another movie comes along. Or look at what happened with Bridesmaid. Nobody thought that a movie, that an, you know, a, an action comedy or, or could, could be involving all women. And yet here is that night, or big night, um, African, is it, no, big, what was it, girls' night, the one that suddenly took the box office by surprise this summer, um, four African-American women on a sort of raunchy weekend, and it did incredibly well. So that would be an example where you'd say, I haven't seen this kind of movie before. Um, are there any particular production challenges, special effects, crowds, elaborate sets? You'd probably want to make that. So let's say I'm a producer, and I tell you as the readers, here's a bunch of action adventures. Do you, um, let me know what's going on here. And you say, huge spectacles. I might, my, like, big production here. Huge car traces. I might be really into that. Or on the other hand, I'm somebody who just likes basically smaller, character-driven movies, and along comes this script. And it just fits the complete opposite of what I'd, I'd be interested. Jana Memel, who may or may not come in because she's doing something else at the moment, but I know, for example, if I wanted to work with her and I had a horror script, I would never give her a horror script. She's not interested in making horror movies. Okay? I, on the other hand, love horror movies. So if you were a writer pitching me a horror movie, I would be really interested in that. Would I be interested in probably... Um, uh, Historical dramas, you know, set in prehistoric times, probably that's not my thing. I'm not really interested in that. But so as a reader, you want to tell people, give the person as much information as you can. Okay, so we, um, we can skip this. Um, so let's actually go to, let's go to, um, <coughs> excuse me. Let's go to a, um, oh, sorry, let's go here. <coughs> this isn't, let me, let me just go over some of this. So the ICM coverage, which again, I, this, which you can find online, <coughs> ideas of how to do this. But let me tell you how I, how I read a script. When I was doing coverage, this is how I did it. I read a script once, didn't have my pen, pen at the time, just read it, no notes whatsoever. Let it go so I could, I could read it from beginning to end as if it was a movie going on in my head, watching this movie. Then I would pause, I'd take a 15 minute break, and then I might then start making my notes about all these things here. I'd put no, doesn't work, you know, one dimensional, you know, violent, 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 no other side to this guy. Um, and so, what do you look for? You look for the main points of the plot, the main and supporting characters, aspects of work pertaining to the purpose of your coverage. For example, if you are asked by a talent agent to do the coverage paying particular attention to the female lead in the movie, that's where your energy and your, most of your words should be about because that agent wants to know is this a project for my client? They don't care as much about the plot, except insofar as it has to do with my female agent. Okay. Similarly, <clears throat> studios looking for an action adventure, big act, summer tentpole blockbuster movie, and so they give you a script. 
you're going to focus on, is that in this script? Is that what this is about? Does this have this? You're going to build that up. Not, you're not going to make up stuff. You're going to just indicate, this is really important. This is the producer, the production company executive wants to know, is desperately looking for that next huge summer blockbuster. Okay? Um, ignore. Oh, sorry. Uh, visual value also, like, is this 100 pages later? I don't even know what was going on. There was nothing visual about this story. Ignore things like typos, grammatical errors, um, wrong tenses, going into the past tense. Skim, meaning quickly go over, just as you're reading, just glance through it. Fight scenes, chase scenes, love scenes, bloodbaths, background and internal action unrelated to the main plot or the major, major points of character development. Again, you don't have to describe to the person who you're, who's reading your report what went on in this love scene. If it's erotic or steamy, you would say, um, Ex Leprechaun and Mary fight their urges, and finally they give in. They have a steamy encounter. We don't have to see here about the three pages. He touches her. He kisses her. He, 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 he licks her from head to toe. We don't need any of that. You just be very short. And same thing with your big fight sequence. A battle, an enormous battle between thousands of people on each side. Bodies, you know, bodies lying around, just decimated, killed. Um, uh, and then finally, nobody left. Everybody's dead. Okay? You just, quick. Um, all right. Writing the synopsis. Stick to the main plot. Um, I didn't actually do this myself, but if as they suggest, after you read that first draft, just start writing. Just start typing. Um, write as much as you can from memory. You want to capture the mood and the tone. So again, if you're dealing with, let's say, an erotic thriller, you should have words in there that describe that. Um, let me give you an example of um, something that, if I did this in a story, like let's say the character does this, okay? and you want to describe that, it, that seems important to you, which of these would feel right to you as were if you read this? He touches the table. Does that sound like describing, right? That's, that's not matching what I'm doing. He pats the table. Is that it? No. He caresses the table. Is that it? No. He hits the table. Is that it? That's, that's sort of, that's one thing you could say. He pounds his fists on the table. Does that fit? Okay, that's important because if I'm suggesting that um, this guy's really, he's so angry and he's about to do something, and you said he, pound, he pounds his fists on the table, he pounds his fists through the wall, he walks out, and he's ready for battle. Okay, that's a better description than he pats the table, he touches the table, he sees the table. If I <clears throat> have to run out of this room, because five seconds a bomb is going to go off. Does it make sense for me to describe he walks out of the room? No. He, um, he rushes out of the room. He bolts out of the room. He explodes out of the room. Okay? And again, those words match what the genre, what I'm expecting of this genre. Okay? Um, Uh, use evocative words. That's, that's an example of that, to best describe the scene. Again, just remember, your mantra is, I want the person to see the movie as, uh, as it is written. Show the work in its best light. So if Jana were here, she and I would have this disagreement. She loved when readers would trash a script, I would say. Um, I, on the other hand, really don't want, I want a reader to say, if, so if a reader said, reading this, I would rather have all of my teeth knocked out of my mouth than have to read this script ever again. That's probably not a comment I would necessarily want to hear. 
unless I really like the reader. On the other hand, you know, something for me would be more, more to the effect of, um, this, was, this was one of the most challenging scripts I've ever had to read for the following reasons, okay? Again, if I, because the, here's the thing, somebody writing like that often suggested to me that they were a struggling screenwriter, they were a bitter screenwriter working as a script reader, a lot of screenwriters are script readers, and I'm not as much interested in kind of who they are as, as uh, I don't want to get that sense of them that basically anything that they read, they're going to be really hard on a script. So that's not the, really what I'm interested in. I'm interested in more about accuracy. I don't need this big hyperbole about it. Um, uh, forget the character breakdown, unimportant for us. Okay, your comment section. How original is it? For me, that was a really important thing to get. First of all, I could usually sense it by the story, and uh, by, the, by the log line, rather, and then by how the synopsis is. How original is it, whether it's high concept or a soft story? Does anybody know what high concept means? It's a hook, a big hook to the movie. The minute you hear it, you know, you know what it's about. So, did anybody see Hangover? OK. Just kind of just off the top of your head, what was that about? What would be a log line for that? How about something like here would be a Kai concept. Um, after a raucous night of partying in Las Vegas, the, um, the, uh, the what do you call that? The, the male, the, the uh, groom's um, best man and friends wake up to discover the groom is missing. And the wedding is 20, 12 hours away. OK, again, bad, kind of a bad, I could work on that for a long time. But basically, a story about a, a groom missing, and they've got 12 hours to find him. That immediately, we get what this movie is about. That's an example of a high concept versus a movie like Manchester by the Sea, a despairing uncle discovers when, he, when a despairing uncle um, is forced to take care of his nephew, um, he discovers he's not up to the task. Something like that. That's not a big hook, right? That's sort of a, it's sort of more of a character-driven story. All right. Um, uh, premise or the theme. Is it a universal theme? Is it, which is often, we're interested in that, right? Two people struggle through a marriage um, after their son dies, people, that's a relatable story. Maybe other people, even if it hasn't happened, you kind of get it. Um, does it feel like it has a strong premise to it? The plot, is it predictable? How many people have seen a movie where you thought to yourself, I know what's going to happen next, and it happened next? Okay, that's not a particularly interesting thing that, we're in, that we want to see. So um, you would want to bring that up. On the other hand, you could often you could say, if they had done this, that would have been really surprising and would have been fantastic. Obstacles, complications, reversals, twists. Again, we want to. Every movie has to have conflict. Every movie has to have sort of these surprises, even if it's a comedy. And so, you want to be able to talk about that. Is it believable? Is this really a premise that could happen if it's set in the present day and it's talking about? Um, Cloning human beings, maybe that's, we're a little bit away from that. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, uh, the subplots, how, were they good? Were they interesting? The hook, right at the end of a first act is, you know, your, your, char your character's taking off in a different direction than he or she thought. But there's an incident made right before that, an inciting incident that suddenly makes everything change for this character. What is it? Continuity. Um, do, are things being fought, do things make sense? Uh, again, talk about main and supporting characters in the same way. M many people don't, many writers don't really know how to write small roles. They just focus on the main person. So you want to talk about that. Um, the, do they have, what's their motivations? Fatal flaws, consistent development, rooting interest, the spice of life. Just describe this character, especially the protagonist and especially maybe the secondary characters or the antagonists, and go through a number of 
Um, just think about all the things that you could describe. Is it working or not? Is it believable or not? Does this person have an interesting background? Do they have interesting fatal flaws, things that undo them? Dialogue. Dialogue reveals character traits, reveals essential information, flows or flounders. So how do you, when you, do, do, when you watch a movie, do you focus on the dialogue? Tony, you say no? Well, a dialogue is basically one of the things that helps advance the story. You don't want to use it too much. Um, you might have a character who does, who's an incessant talker, talks nonstop. So you might want to describe that and describe how interesting that dialogue is. Like, wow, this person never shut up. And you know what? I was glad I could have watched this for, I could have listened to this person forever. Um, so do you, let's see. I think we can, let's go, now let's, uh, yeah, let's just go a little. So, okay. Let's go, we're going through this template again, right? We're going through this, we're going through all these characteristics. Let's just finish this up quickly. Um, structure. Um, well, let's go right, right over here, rather. Dialogue, let's just finish up. Is it overwritten or underwritten? What does overwritten dialogue mean? Anybody have an idea? Pages and pages. So what you would do, so I have, uh, one of the people I worked with was Robert Rodad, who wrote Saving Private Ryan. He told, I said, I asked him, what's, I always ask writers what their writing process is. He says, the first draft nobody will ever see. It can be 250 pages. I just spew this stuff out. Then I have to start taking my, you know, uses a, actually he uses a red line of a script. He starts deleting the lines. Or is it underwritten? The opposite. Is there not enough? Okay, is what some, some, some people really don't like writing dialogue, but in the process of not writing the dialogue, it's so sparse that it's like, doesn't really help. Like a Paul Schrader script uh, to me um, is, is often that kind of script. It's just like, I'm begging a little bit more. I don't quite have enough. Um, the stakes, really important. Does this feel like a movie that somebody wants to see? Is it a big enough, is there, is there a big enough um, uh, thing that the person is seeking? Um, did they capture that? How critical is it? How dangerous is it? Okay, the story of Hangover. It's a pretty dangerous thing. It's, it's, if anybody saw the movie, the bride is waiting at the altar when suddenly the groom finally rushes in after all this adventure. Finally, they got the groom to the altar. Um, structure. Uh, how is this set up and how is it, how does it flow throughout? Does it make sense? Is there a beginning, a middle, and an end? Is it really clear? Is the beginning too short? Is the middle too long? Is the end going on? Have any, people have seen movies? What did I just see? I saw, I saw The Kingsman, the first one, and I thought, boy, I think this movie had too many endings. It had the big match, the ending involving the end of the world kind of thing. And then it had an ending where this guy has to beat up, who did he have to beat up in the beginning? He had to beat up his, his, his um, stepfather, who was just a bastard, right? And very abusive toward the mother. Um, that you would want to mention, something like that. Pacing, same thing. Fast, slow, varied. Um, um, writing itself. Does this person feel, this is important to me, when I, when I, so a reader tells me, this is a writer to look at, to watch. This is a writer to get in business with because even if the script doesn't work, this writer knows how to write. Um, do they have a, do they have their own style? Have we never kind of seen it before? That's interesting. The concept and execution. Do they know how to write and do they know how to execute it? Um, uh, what, now this is again something you may not know right away, but who is this story geared toward? Is this a PG-13 movie? What does that mean? Anybody know PG? Right, so it's saying that this is basically for 13 year olds and over. If you have a 10 year old and you're looking for a story about for little kids, that may not be it. Um, the age, the sex, 
Is it, does it feel more like it's a feature film, or does it feel like you could see it on television um, or public television? Okay. Um, does the work succeed in its objectives? Do, do we feel like this is a story that um, the writer set up this premise and he executed this premise perfectly? Um, does it give us the sense we want? You have a story that's supposed to be a tearjerker, right? You're supposed to be crying your eyes out. Titanic, right? That movie, at the end of the movie, somebody in a, another um, class of mine described it as she went with her grandmother and fought for five times, and five times her, mother, her grandmother was, quote, bitterly weeping. She was so upset. So that's a movie that evoked what it was meant to do, or does it leave you dry and you could care less about these characters? Um, all right, so let's actually go now to a um, synopsis. Here, by the way, are some, here are some general genre. When you're asked the genre in that cover sheet, here are the general character, the general um, genre, action, adventure, animation, biographical, comedy, drama, erotic, fantasy, historical. But I like to get a little bit more specific. What kind of comedy is it? Is it an action comedy? Is it a black comedy, meaning it's got kind of it starts very funny and light and then starts getting a little bit scarier and darker. Um, here is some secondary genre. So this is the kind of thing that sometimes I like to see when somebody's describing a story to me. Um, is it a biker movie? Is it a farce, meaning it's just kind of um, silly? Is it um, an escape movie? It is post-apocalyptic. The world has ended except for the people in this story. Um, it just gives you a little bit more information. Again, the more specific you can be, the better it is for somebody who's hired you to read. We can skip the locations. The settings. Here might be, let's check out some of these settings. Outer space. That would be important for us in the beginning to know where this is a courtroom. Generally, it's a courtroom drama. Okay, It's somebody, are they going to be found guilty or not guilty of a murder? So these are just, you, again, your script will tell you the general setting. So let me give you one example of coverage. I've never read the script, but I don't have to based on what I've read. So we have the general information. We have the title of the script, Sarah. We have the author, Pamela Gray. In this particular configuration, this is ICM, the literary agency. They're asking is this a client of ours? The answer is no. Therefore, you can be completely brutally honest about the script. Um, who is the studio who has submitted it? Universal. Who's the producer? Universal. Um, nobody's attached. There's no director. So let's say they're looking for actors. There's no director. So oftentimes, actors won't commit to a project until they know who's directing them. Um, it takes place in Romania in a concentration camp during World War II. It's 129 pages. It's a medium budget, so the, so the reader thinks. And um, it's a drama. And they call it, they get even more specific, a Holocaust drama. OK, so we don't have to go through this. I just want to show you how this, I want to show you just some general characteristics of this. Notice, I actually took this and had it done, reformatted it. When I looked at the script, it was huge, one paragraph, huge, OK? That's not how you want to read. You want to make this light, on, make this easy to read. So I found places to break up into paragraphs that made sense. So remember our rules. Give the time frame if it's important. So this starts out in 1983. Our character, the first time this person is mentioned, Sarah, she's written in capital letters. Um, she lies in a hospital bed dying of cancer. She sews her daughter's wedding gown and promises to be at the wedding before she passes away. Now we flash back to Romania 1923. Notice how this is written. It's in the present tense, so I, as a reader, can watch what's happening in the scene. Five-year-old Sarah 
is already a leader in her enormous family. Her mother, Miriam, cooks and cleans, right? We get to see that. While her father, Abraham, slaves away at the local mill. Check out that word, slaves away. What does that tell you about his job? It's brutal, right? So what they don't say is, imagine instead saying her father, Abraham, works at the local mill. That doesn't give you a, a sense, the real sense of what's going on here. Sarah is obviously very intelligent and at an early age exhibits a talent for sewing. What, what are we seeing in the scene with Sarah? What is she doing? Who said it? Who said that? She's sewing, right? The reader's telling us she exhibits a talent for sewing. So probably we would hear dialogue that would be, you know, or it's just clear it's exquisite. You know, it's like, it's something that you wouldn't expect. Okay? Now, we're, now we've come, gone forward, and now she's, she's five here. At 14, she's a star student and seamstress. Her teacher, no, Abraham, um, okay, this was a mistake. Miriam should be capital letters. Her teacher prepares to announce the lucky student to win a scholarship. Sarah becomes the school's first Jewish winner. Despite the honor, Abe forbids Sarah from going to Bucharest. So again, there's an argument, clearly saying, no, you're not going. Miriam, however, knows she should leave and packs her suitcase for her. So what the writer didn't hear say, Miriam, um, uh, Miriam decides the opposite, and she leaves. She gives us description of what's actually happening in the scene. Okay, let's go on. We have this again, the capital. A letter for the priest speeches. It talks about how dirty and malevolent the Jews are. So again, the, the priest speeches um, how bad Jews are. Okay, no, it's even worse than that. It's 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 more intense and hateful. Um, okay, so let's take again. Language is important here. Even if it's your second language, just play around. I often find myself looking at a thesaurus, figuring what's a better word to describe what's going on. She takes a job, where is that? She takes a job as a seamstress from a local tailor and flourishes under his guidance. Does anybody know what that means, flourish? Ex excels, right, excels. She's great at it. She's, she's thriving. As opposed to, at Sarah, she takes a job as a seamstress from a local tailor and works under his guidance. Again, it's not giving you the sense of what's happening in the story. Um, uh, let's see. So let's just skip, skip down. So uh, let's, we can go down to the character. The, um, so again, notice, my rule of thumb is, if at all possible, no more than two or three, three or four sentences in a paragraph, and no more than like five or six lines. Just make it kind of light and easy to see. When I see a script like with a, when I see a paragraph that's this long, I find myself, just as a person, not even as a producer or a production executive, uh-oh, I just got homework. I'm going to have to, it's slowing me down from reading what, as it turns out, is a script that is unfolds at a beautiful pace. Okay, and so we have this summary. It should be one to two pages, single space. No, no, um, sorry. Single space, no paragraph indentation. It's all flush left. And it is um, double space between paragraphs. All right. I would say about this, the comments were too light. But let's go look at what they, let's go take, check, check this out. Reading the synopsis to Sarah before reading the screenplay is an injustice. This story is so compelling and the writing so exquisite that the reader was moved to tears. There are so many details that the synopsis does not include that not taking a look at the screenplay is a mistake. Gray's adaptation of The Seamstress, it's based on a book, is a wonderful piece of writing. If you received that, if you read that as a producer, director, or production executive, or actress, would that be something you would say, I need to read this script? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like it's begging. This person is saying, 
my God, somebody has to make this script. Okay, this is unbelievable. They're, the characters, especially Sarah, are amazing, and the plot continuously gut-wrenching. Um, I'm not a big fan of this word here, or amazing. Amazing to you and amazing to me are two different things. Hopefully the writer will start to get into the detail. It's, it's um, again, repeating the word amazing and refreshing to see Sarah's unbelievable sense of humor and resilience, her ability to bounce back in light of all the tragedy unfolding before her. The pain this woman has had to endure is not only tragic, but in many ways inspiring. She's a woman who never abandons hope. You never doubt that in spite of everything, she will get through this. Oh, Jerry, is this like, is this the one that, is this the Kate Winslet movie where she, what's, what was that? Is that the same, that's not the same product. She won the Academy Award? I'm just trying to think, what is that? Oh no, anyway, it's starting to ring a bell now as a movie I've seen. Okay. As a feature film, so now we're getting through some more, some more detail. As a feature film and a directorial vehicle, Sarah is an unbelievable challenge. What does that sentence tell to you as, again, this is just the reader's opinion, but what is the reader trying to say here? It's a unbelievable challenge. What kind of director do you need for this? First time director? No, right? They're, the reader is suggesting this is really a difficult movie to really get right. Okay, and again, it's just a reader's opinion, but maybe the reader is onto something. There's no doubt that this movie will be compared to Schindler's List. That's part of what they're saying. You got to be careful. You don't want everybody. You don't want this to be compared to Schindler's List. You want to make it. A director has to have a certain sense of style and ability to make this feel like it's its own interesting Holocaust movie, because they're going to touch on the same subject matter, obviously. Although the story is much different, it is so powerful and honest that the two films can't help but be compared. So what's interesting about this is somebody might read the synopsis and think, oh, it's Schindler's List all over again. This reader is telling you it's not. It's completely different. Um, so. There she is. We're, I think we're, we're almost heading, heading home. Okay. Jana Memel is back there, the head of the program. Um, had she come earlier, she would have had her two Oscars, so she would have, you would have been in, in, in good stead there. Um, so, uh, so continuing on, um, consequently, a director must ask him herself a few questions. Can they make a movie on par with Spielberg, who did the Schindler's List, is the material too close? Do they want to take the challenge to make something that has to be almost as good as one of the best movies of the last 50 years? There is no doubt that this will fall under intense scrutiny. So as a, as a, um, so imagine that you're an agent representing a director. So these are questions that a director will have to think about long and hard, and many directors will pass on this. Even if they like this kind of story, they may say, I'm going to make this and I'm going to be compared to Steven Spielberg and that's the end of my career because nobody's going to ever see this movie. It's just, not, just it's a hard movie to get people reeled into. Um, if a will director is willing to deal with these kind of external pressures that the reader perceives, the person writing this, then absolutely they should go for it. It's a beautiful story and fresh angle on a period in history that people cannot be reminded about enough. So at this point then, they go to their grid, which is a little bit different than mine, that we use here. And here are all the things. So I want you to notice something. So artistically, they give this an excellent. Commercial, good, meaning, why do, they, why do you think they do that? It's a hard sell. It's a story about the Holocaust. Most people immediately, in the, in the film business, the easiest word to come out of your mouth is no. No, I'm not interested. Then yes, I'm going to take a risk. So this is a smart thing to say. In fact, you might even say maybe it's so-so because it's just such a hard subject to deal with. However, this script is so beautifully written. If this script weren't so beautifully written, maybe the reader would have put something over here. 
Let's get into the stuff that we have. Story, excellent. Characterization, excellent. Um, they broke it up, very good. Dialogue, excellent. Uh, visual elements, excellent. Let's go to ours thing. Suppose, given how this coverage was written and what they thought of this, they wrote characterization fair. Dialogue, maybe on the line between good and fair. Storyline, maybe poor. What's the problem with that, given how, what they thought of the script? It doesn't match. When you read a script, as, a, as you're going to do, as the people here are doing now in, in some of my courses and doing in other courses, your comments that you make have to match what you think. And so it doesn't have to be all great. Take each thing separately. One-dimensional characters, not very interesting. I've seen this 100 times before. Feel free to give it a poor or a fair or poor, OK? Because that matches what you think, OK? If you, and the, despite that, though, Great storyline, never saw this before. This should be made. Somebody should figure out how to make this. You might put it here. That's not a contradiction. That's taking two different things and treating them separately as it should be. OK, so then the last part is, notice this. You, the reader, what do you think? What are you going to recommend? In this case, your choices are to recommend to consider or to pass. Recommend says definitely producer, production company, executive director, agent, whatever, read this script. This is worthy of a movie getting made, a story getting made. Consider, you might say, if it was, you know, this is kind of interesting. This is, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence. Not, I think you should look, take a look at this. Pass, seen it five million times, not done very well. But now let's go to the writer. Again, the writer they're recommending. Even if you don't want to do this movie, you got to meet this writer, see if you have another project, work with this writer. Consider, writer had some good things, really great with dialogue, really wrote interesting characters. The story, the structure, ugh, God, it just didn't, didn't have to really structure the story. Or pass. Forget this, forget the writer. So that's what script coverage is. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything from online? Anybody here? Everybody get it? So here's, yeah, so you have a question? Okay, so here's the thing about script coverage. It's really hard in the beginning. It's like anything that you learn for the first time. The only way you get better at it is by doing it over and over and over. It's like a muscle that you're gonna develop. It's gonna become a lot easier as you go on so that's why in a lot of the courses, you're asked to do 13 script coverages, okay? Because um, it's important, number one. There's no expectation that you're gonna be able, the first one that you do and the 13th one that you will do will be night and day, okay? All right, well, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. How do you look for this job? How do you look, okay, that's another workshop that I'm doing. Um, how you look for this job is, well, there's lots of ways. There's online job sites where, you know, where they basically post jobs. And it'll say script reader or it'll say assistant to producer responsibilities or what they're looking for. One of the things, answer phones, put together the calendar, be able to multitask, um, have good um, uh, phone manner, and then be able to read and cover scripts. Okay, or here's another thing, you you meet a you're a you're a director and you want to work for, as an assistant to a director, which may involve picking up his or her dry cleaning, walking the dog, picking up the poop from the dog, um, buying gifts, everything that you have no interest in doing, but you know that if you do it well, you'll get on the good side of the person. That's who they're looking for, and you might say to them in a meeting. Oh, and by the way, I don't know if you're ever looking for somebody who can read scripts, but I'm a great script reader. That may sell the deal. Like, as you'd say, I'm all for getting you coffee. You just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go five, 50 miles away to get you the coffee that you want. And also, by the way, I'm a good script reader. So when, you know, what year are you in? Okay, so when you, okay, when you, so when you start looking for work in the summer or, you know, you're ready to transition in the film business, 
there you're going to get a lot of information about um, where to look for a job. It can be something from Craigslist. It can be your networking here. Lots of online presence. Start going to film festivals and making in local film festivals and start getting, you know, finding out, you know, volunteering, 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 volunteering. All right, great. Take care. Any, I'm around. I'm here. Feel free.